Fetal Origins of Success. A week ago yesterday, our daughter Abigail began kindergarten. It was a very proud moment for my wife and myself, and I have no doubt that this is going to be a very uh, enriching and rewarding year for her that's going to shape the rest of her life. It's going to be a very important nine months of schooling. What I'd ask you to think about is our daughter five years ago uh, today, when she was about six months uh, gestation. How important is that period, that environmental period she experienced uh, five years ago, relative to what she's experiencing now, her first year in kindergarten. The hypothesis that this all uh, comes from is called the fetal origins hypothesis. The fetal origins hypothesis comes to us from epidemiology and basically says that childhood is built upon a foundation, and that foundation is the prenatal period. Heart disease, hypertension, obesity, all sorts of these chronic conditions of adulthood in some sense have their roots in the prenatal period. D.J. Barker is a physician and epidemiologist in Britain, and he's uh, most closely associated with this hypothesis. And he brought it about, say, 25 years ago, and it was very controversial at the time, and to some extent it remains a controversial hypothesis. The paradigm that it was arguing against was this perfect parasite. Um, view of the fetus. So the perfect parasite view of the fetus is that the fetus does, is a very selfish fetus, and when there's an environmental insult of any kind, it gets first priority. The mom, she's the buffer, and the fetus is protected. The fetal origins hypothesis came along and said, maybe the mom isn't such a great buffer, and maybe the parasite isn't such a perfect parasite. Maybe it's sort of a lousy parasite. Evidence for this revised view comes in part from studies of famines. So famines are obviously very severe uh, nutritional shocks, and one of the most studied nutritional shocks was this Dutch famine right at the end of World War II. So at the end of World War II, the Nazis cut off food shipments uh, to the Netherlands, and a, a very uh, severe famine ensued. There was also actually a fairly short famine um, by famine standards. A reason why this famine is so studied is because the data are so good. Famines, in general, don't happen in countries with good data, um, and this is an exception. Researchers have studied this famine at great length and found many chronic health conditions um, when we observe these cohorts 40, 50 years later that are worse for the cohort that happened to be in utero. So say they were conceived in the summer of 1944 or fall of 1944. The famine came along. It disrupted uh, gestational development. And now we see effects persistent into adulthood. Economics. So I'm an economist. And economists have been very active in this uh, field, which is originally uh, coming to us from epidemiology. And I'm going to argue that there are three contributions that economists have made uh, that are very important to this field. The first is, it's not just about famines. The second is, it's not just about health outcomes. Outcomes that economists study and demographers and other people, things like wages, are, are, are just as affected as health conditions in many cases. And finally, I think there's been a, a, a movement that has provided much more credible evidence on um, these linkages. So now I'm going to develop those three points. On the first point, famine is obviously a very severe experience. So it, it might be unsurprising in some sense that if you did something as disruptive as starve a mother, that there'll be some developmental shortcuts that will occur with the fetus. And those shortcuts, while they may uh, help maintain the viability of the fetus, there may be developmental consequences later in life. What we've seen with recent research is it doesn't take something as severe as a famine. Indeed, it doesn't even take something that's like a nutritional shock. It can be something more like disease experienced in utero. So, Influenza infection, malaria infection, stress experienced by the mother, pollution, a whole um, bevy of prenatal experiences seem to operate in a way that's very similar to the nutritional shocks studied in epidemiology. It's also worth noting that these experiences that have been studied more recently are much more mild than famine shocks. It doesn't take starving a pregnant mother to generate effects 40 and 50 years down the road. 
What this means is that common everyday experiences are relevant for fetal origins. That's the first point. On to the second point. So health, comp health outcomes are obviously a very important set of outcomes to consider. Other things uh, which we are also interested in as students or as parents or as researchers um, are also affected. So a case in point is test scores. A host of recent papers has shown that kids' performance on standardized tests responds very sharply to the prenatal environment. This includes math scores. And I mention math scores because some people believe that math scores tie more closely to IQ. So if we have IQ responding to the prenatal period, what I view that as is pulling back sort of for environmental influences, something people sometimes think um, are more genetic. And the, the, the key thing here is we trace it to the environmental influences that occurred before birth. Now economists um, also care about a great deal about things like wages and income. We find effects for wages and income as well. We find it for demographic outcomes like do you get married and to whom do you get married. Lots of things other than health status are affected. Indeed, it, it, it becomes a challenge in some sense to find things that are not affected uh, by the prenatal environment. That gets me to my third point. Um, this, in some sense, may start to sound a bit like astrology. And it may even bear more than passing resemblance to astrology because I would argue that some of the evidence that has been marshaled in support of the fetal origins hypothesis is actually sort of astrology caliber evidence that makes the mistake of, of, of equating correlation and causation. What I think um, people in, in uh, the recent design-based tradition in economics have done is contribute much more compelling evidence to this question. Now, we probably all know that randomized control trials are the best um, way to uh, test a causal hypothesis, and there, there's a lot of evidence on the effect of um, childhood interventions that come from such, uh, from such uh, randomized control trials. When we think about the prenatal period, it becomes a bit more difficult to... Um, to uh, construct such a trial for sort of some obvious reasons, but also maybe some, from some less obvious reasons that we have to have conducted that trial maybe 40 years ago to see now what the effects are of you know, randomizing nutritional supplements in, during the prenatal period. So what researchers have done instead is look for accidental randomizations, okay? And accidental randomizations are situations where the prenatal environment was arbitrarily changed through historical accident. And I'll give a couple of examples of those. First is the 1918 influenza pandemic. The 1918 influenza pandemic, as you know, was a major mortality event both in the US and, and worldwide. What may be less well known is how suddenly it appeared. This figure here shows the number of deaths in the US um, plotted by the month. And what you see is in October 1918, there's a huge spike in the number of deaths. Up until October 1918, things were fairly normal. And then out of nowhere, in some sense, uh, the, the pandemic arrives. It lasts for about four or five months of heightened death rates and then falls back to um, sort of more normal levels. While the pandemic was a huge mortality event, that was actually not the most common experience with the 1918 flu. The most common experience with the 1918 flu was you got sick, you got you got better and you survived. That was true too of pregnant women. So about one in three pregnant women in the United States was infected with the 1918 flu and survived. That brings us to the question of those babies who were born shortly after the flu and experienced it in utero, how do they do later in life? We can fast forward 40 years to 1960, okay, and take US census data, which has a nice big large sample, and we consider the average level of schooling of people by their birth year. So this figure plots um, from 1912 to 1922, what's the average uh, level of schooling for each of those birth years? You see an upward trend. And that upward trend is just the increasing educational attainment in the United States, in part due to the compulsory school laws um, that, were, that were coming into effect at that time. What you also see is a big divergence from that trend for the cohort born in 1919. That 1919 cohort with the line through it was in utero 
at the height of the pandemic. And we see that these particular people have much lower educational attainment than we would have expected from the rather smooth trend. We can make additional comparisons as well. The pandemic varied in severity across the United States. We can ask whether in a state like Pennsylvania, which experienced a worse pandemic than did New York, is this divergence from trend larger than it would be if you experienced it in a more mild uh, state? And that is exactly what we observe as well. So that's an additional set of comparisons that makes us believe that there really was a lasting causal effect of the 1918 flu. We can also fast forward to 1980. So the cohorts are now a little over uh, 60 years old, and we see across a whole range of outcomes, including their wages and income, large effects of that event 60 years prior that's in our distant memory, still affecting how much I'm making um, and, and, and whether I'm disabled, my physical condition as well, a 20% increase in the rate of disability due to the 1918 flu. Second example is a slightly more recent one, the 1986 uh, core meltdown at Chernobyl. The, uh, the meltdown occurred in April of 1986, and unfortunately for Sweden, and as this video from IRSN uh, will show, the wind was blowing to the northwest. And what that meant is that the radioactive plume flew over the Baltic and then over Sweden. If you were in Sweden and it rained, that also deposited more of the um, ionizing radiation. So what we have is this nice natural experiment, nice from a researcher's perspective, obviously, a nice natural experiment in variation in radiation across Sweden. We can look at the cohort that was in utero, and particularly in utero in those places that by virtue of rainfall in the spring and summer of 1986, received more ionizing radiation. Now, nobody thought Chernobyl was a, was, had a hot spot in Sweden. In, indeed, you know, uh, both I and my wife were in Sweden in 1986, and uh, you know, it was acknowledged that there was some fallout there, but it wasn't considered dangerous levels, and certainly uh, people didn't think it was levels that would cause cancer. Nevertheless, when we look at their schooling records, and Sweden has great data on schooling records, you observe big effects on test scores in middle school, test scores in high school, and uh, matriculation from middle school to high school due to this Chernobyl event in 1986. So this damage that we see for this cohort is what physicians call subclinical. We can, we can detect it in the test scores data, but they don't seem unhealthy in a way that they would present at a doctor's office or something like that. So I'd like to close with the following. The environmental period we experience all the way back to conception has very important effects on our later life outcomes. Second, public policies can and should make use of this opportunity to intervene very early. There are some examples of that where uh, people have studied programs like food stamps and detected long-run effects of those programs. But at, pr at present, that's not really the way we think of, of, of programs and interventions. We target interventions much later in life, closer to the time that test is being taken, like our daughter's uh, kindergarten program this year. And in a sense, this is sort of the pound of cure approach. Uh, and we would argue for targeting these interventions much earlier in life and sort of using that fact that prenatal period is a foundation upon which the rest of childhood uh, is built. My final point uh, concerns disparities. So you're well aware that there are large health and economic disparities in the US and across countries uh, as, as well. These disparities, I think, have proven very persistent and difficult to reduce. I think one of the lessons of the fetal origins literature is we're trying too late. We need to combine our later life interventions with early life interventions as well to use the fact that the prenatal period is the foundation for later life outcomes. Thank you very much.